I, uh, I'm Gordon Jarvanen. I've been working on separations technology at Los Alamos National Laboratory for a number of years. I'm going to talk about precipitation and crystallization, another type of unit operation uh, used in the uh, separations toolkit. Uh, but to begin, I also want to talk about a little bit about the complexation chemistry. Um, the uh, Alan Croft yesterday uh, discussed the nuclear properties of the elements in, in some detail, but the separations that Bob and Jack and Mike talked about this morning are based on the electronic properties of the elements. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about uh, the F elements and their uh, chemical properties. Uh, but beyond that, uh, get into precipitation and crystallization where you generate supersaturation in a solution and get a solid to come out. They have nucleation growth uh, and then agglomeration and aging of that material. Uh, batch versus continuous processes. And, that, and of course, something we're really not going to discuss in any detail in this short course, uh, how you do the solid-liquid separations, things like filtration and centrifugation. There's a lot of technology uh, there. Uh, co-precipitation or carrier precipitation, so when you use one phase to bring down small amounts of another material, that's a very important tool, especially in analytical methods for the radionuclides. But plutonium was first isolated in this way, and I'll talk about that briefly. And then give some examples of uh, crystallization and precipitation used for plutonium and uranium uh, product preparation and purification and uh, some cesium and strontium separations examples. So returning to the electronic properties of the elements, uh, the actinides are down here at the bottom, and we talk about uh, filling orbitals. That's a, a term that really comes from an old model of the atom developed by Niels Bohr uh, when he considered the electrons to be orbiting the nucleus, much like the planets orbit the sun. Uh, as we've found out in the mysterious world of uh, quantum uh, mechanics, that's, that's not quite how uh, things are. It's more like a uh, probability cloud for these electrons, but they do have distinct energy states. And as we fill those uh, orbitals uh, with electrons, uh, you have the, the different uh, chemical elements. Uh, for the actinide series, you're filling the 5F uh, orbitals. And so they're all in a row here. Uh, again, the properties are similar, but they uh, change in important ways. And as uh, Bob mentioned this morning, the early actinides in particular uh, uh, differ from the uh, later uh, actinides, and that's important for the separation properties. So again, the, uh, these 5F electrons are uh, not as accessible to bonding as the outer electrons, the 7S and 6D electrons, but the uh, uh, all potentially can participate in, in uh, bonding. But the 5F electrons, because of their uh, being more buried in the electron cloud, uh, participate less in the bonding, but that does lead to some interesting changes in properties. This is a, a plot of the uh, atomic volume in uh, cubic angstroms versus the atomic number for the actinides. And the uh, volume of the uh, metal is going down steadily until you get to plutonium. And there you have a change in the electronic properties, primarily because of a change in how the 5F electrons are either shared readily between the atoms in the metal, or they're localized around the atom. When they become localized, the volume goes up and these, the, lan the actinides become more like the lanthanides and behave uh, very much like those elements. Plutonium is very interesting because that's where this uh, transition is occurring. And you can see that alpha plutonium metal, rather than continuing the trend that you would expect, and this looks very much like a trend that you would have in the transition elements as you add electrons, uh, you see this jump in the volume. And then if you go to delta plutonium, uh, it's an even, even a larger increase, and plutonium has six different uh, phases, metal phases at uh, atmospheric pressure. There's even a seventh phase. It's a very complicated uh, element, and it's partly for this uh, 
because of these partly localized electrons. Uh, one way, another way of illustrating what Bob showed you this morning in aqueous acid solution, that's these blue squares. These are the most common oxidation states. So when you put the element in solution, uh, it becomes an ion. Uh, plus 3, plus 4, plus 5, plus 6 are the common oxidation states, and that's illustrated in the blocks up here. And as you see, for the lanthanides, it's pretty simple. They all like to be in the plus 3 state. So they like to uh, lose three of their uh, valence electrons, their outer electrons, become a plus 3 ion in an aqueous solution. And so they're very, very similar in behavior. Uh, there are important differences, but overall, there's just a, a gradual shrinking in the ionic radii of, of those metal ions. For the actinides, the early actinides, up through about americium, uh, it's very different. As you saw from Bob's uh, plot this morning, uh, uranium is most stable in aqueous acid, at least in air, in the uh, plus 6 state. Uh, Neptunium 5, plutonium 4, americium, you're back to 3. And those later actinides look much like the lanthanides. But it's these variations in oxidation state that enable you to uh, simplify the separations considerably. The other boxes show other oxidation states that are accessible, uh, and they may be stable in, in other conditions or other media, but uh, these ones in blue are the most stable for the um, aqueous acid solutions, which are commonly used in processing. Again, uh, while many of these species have been referred to, we really didn't give an introduction to uh, some of the qualitative uh, aspects of the actinide chemistry. Uh, the plus three and plus four states are roughly spherical ions where uh, water or other uh, uh, either uh, ligands, as we call them, uh, coordinate to the, to the ion. But in the case, uh, it, it, when you're in, in water at least, the five and six form oxo uh, cations. And they have two oxygens, two oxide anions associated with the metal. And they give you these uh, linear, they're a, an oxygen metal, oxygen in a, in a linear uh, construction, these uh, what are called actinyl anions. So either uh, the five uh, oxidation state or the six, and they form these AnO2 plus and AnO2 2 plus species. Uh, they're what are called hard metal ions. They like um, hard donor ions like oxygen, fluoride, they'll form strong bonds with those things that have, uh, they, these metal ions have high charge to radius ratios. And the general binding order is the tetravalents bind the strongest to these hard donor ligands. Uh, the um, trivalents are, are weaker, roughly equivalent to the hexavalent, and then the pentavalent uh, species are the weakest of all. The redox reactions, in other words, changing oxidation states, as Bob discussed, you can add things like hydrazine, hydroxylamine, other materials to change the oxidation state and adjust it where you want. They occur pretty rapidly when you go between 3 and 4 but, and between 5 and 6 because they have the same uh, type of structure. But when you go from the 4 to the 5, for example, those reactions are often slow and, and can be irreversible because you have to make or break these uh, actinide oxygen bonds that are pretty strong. Uh, again, the uh, chemical bonding in the, in the F element compounds, uh, compared to the lanthanides, the um, actinides have uh, more extended orbitals. The, uh, as you can see here, this is the 4F uh, radial extent of the uh, lanthanide orbitals compared to a similar uh, plutonium-3 cation, in this case, samarium-3, plutonium-3, and the, the 5Fs are a little further from the nucleus and are a little more available for bonding, the same with uh, the outer orbitals, the, the D and uh, S orbitals as well. So that gives the uh, actinides a little more covalent character. They look a little more like transition elements, as I mentioned before, uh, early in the series, and that's useful for uh, separating them and in fact is the basis, we think, uh, this, this larger covalence for the ability of some of the soft donor atoms to separate the trivalent actinides and lanthanides. Uh, 
in processes like uh, TallSpeak and uh, Sanex, uh, Sanex being a process being developed in Europe. Uh, for the variation in the oxidation states, things can get pretty interesting. So I'm not going into any detail here, but just point out that, OK, very briefly, the redox uh, properties can get uh, pretty complicated. Here's the, uh, the um, potentials for changing between the oxidation states in, uh, for plutonium in, in aqueous acid solution. And the going from, five, uh, from 6 to 5, 5 to 4, 4 to 3, all differ about a volt. And what that leads to is you can actually have all four oxidation states under certain conditions in the same solution. Um, and, if, and of course, what ligands you have present in solution can stabilize different oxidation states. So plutonium-4 binding most strongly to a ligand, if you put in something that will complex it, for example, chloride, you can preferentially stabilize the 4 over the other oxidation states. All those can be used to help us in uh, separation processes, for example. But let me just illustrate this very quickly, I'm not going into the details here. In, at various pHs here, you plot the fraction of that particular oxidation state. So you see over a fairly, fairly wide pH range from 1 molar acid to 10 to the minus 2 molar acid, you can have substantial amounts of all four oxidation states present uh, at the same time. That, that's a pretty complicated situation. So if you want it to be in one oxidation state, you need to add a, a redox reagent to force it into uh, one state or another. And then just to give you an idea of the kinetics, I mean, th these are thermodynamics. This is the final uh, equilibrium that you'll reach if you wait long enough at a particular pH. But it can take minutes to hours to get there. This is a case where you start at a particular pH, pH 1, so 10th molar acid, uh, ionic strength of 1, and you start with pure plutonium 4, and then you wait, and over a period of hours, that disproportionates by these sets of reactions uh, up above and gives you the other three oxidation states, and the equilibrium is sometime way out here. This is thousands of seconds uh, that it takes to, to get to equilibrium, so uh, hours to, to days even. So when you're trying to do separations, uh, you have to be aware of all these uh, factors and control that if you want to get a good separation like Bob was talking about uh, this morning. Because if, for example, you're doing a purex type process and your plutonium is split between 4 and 3, only the 4 is going to extract and the 3 is going to be left behind. Uh, this just shows you that they can have uh, interesting colors. These are different oxidation states. Uh, the first four are in acid solutions. The last one to get plutonium-7, which is difficult, that's very high base hydroxide in order to get to, uh, to stabilize plutonium-7. And these colors are useful for following a reaction and for measuring the concentrations of an element in solution. Uh, this shows that even in the same acid, this is all in, uh, well, not all of them are in uh, perchloric acid, but in the same um, uh, oxidation state, rather, in different uh, media, the, the color can change as well. And so that's also a useful diagnostic. So now using all this information in the precipitation crystallization process is the, the major topic. And these both refer to processes that generate a solid out of a, a solution, and, and you need supersaturation to do that. You can generate the supersaturation in the solution by a variety of mechanisms, a solvent extraction uh, or solvent removal by evaporation or dialysis, for example. Uh, quick show of hands, how many people have ever made rock candy when they were kids from sugar solution or done it with their children? Well, then you've been doing crystallization. There you used a warm solution of sugar, and then when you cool it down, it becomes super saturated. If you have a string in there, it usually will uh, deposit the crystals uh, preferentially on the string, and you grow that, that rock candy. So that's a crystallization process. And of course, the, the sugar you buy, the granular sugar, is a, done on a very large scale, crystallization of that from the uh, 
the liquor that you get from sugar cane. So there are a variety of ways of generating that uh, supersaturation. Uh, then you try to control that and then separate the solid from the liquid by filtration or centrifugation, for example. Uh, Ray Weimer mentioned yesterday that some precipitates are not so easy to deal with. If you do this poorly, then you get something that's a sludge and is very, very difficult to, to filter or, or centrifuge out. Now, there's a great variety of equipment for precipitation and crystallization and that subsequent uh, separation. Uh, you, there are whole courses, of course, given on, uh, on these processes and the different ways of doing it. And, and there's a vast array of industrial processes that use precipitation and crystallization. That's from pharmaceuticals to electronics, you know, the, the silicon that you use in the uh, electronic devices, uh, to nuclear materials, which we're discussing here. Uh, and in designing the precipitation crystallization, you're often doing more than just purifying the material or just getting it out of solution so that you can do the next step. You engineer it to reduce the cost of the final product. For example, in the case of a precipitation of, or crystallization of uranium and uh, to get this ammonium uh, uranyl carbonate, you want to control the crystal size though, so that when you convert that into UO2, you get particle size that's right for making your fuel pellets. So you want to control that. Uh, in addition to just getting a pure product, you want the size of it to be just right so that it works well in the uh, subsequent processes. So here's an, a couple of examples. Uh, and what's the difference between pre uh, precipitation and crystallization? Usually, precipitation refers to a relatively irreversible process. So you add something like hydroxide to precipitate a uh, very insoluble hydroxide. Or you add, in this case, this is plutonium oxalate, plutonium-3 oxalate. So we add oxalic acid to a nitric acid solution of the plutonium-3, and this uh, Turquoise solid that's uh, kind of pretty material precipitates out and can be filtered uh, to get the get the product. In order, it, it's relatively irreversible because to get that plutonium back into solution, you have to use enough acid to uh, redissolve the uh, oxalate and and turn it back into uh, oxalic acid and and redissolve the plutonium. In the case of a crystallization, you often use something like in the case of making rock candy, uh, using a hot solution and cooling it to generate supersaturation. And that's relatively easy to reverse. If you heat the solution up again, you can redissolve it. And this is an illustration. This is uh, some crystals we made in the laboratory of uranyl nitrate hexahydrate. Uh, if you do a relatively low supersaturation and slow growth, it, it may be too slow. These crystals were so big. Uh, this is about maybe a three-inch uh, crystallizing dish that we, we put these in. They occlude solvent in them. So the occluded solvent, meaning the crystal grows around them and traps bits of the uh, liquid, that is, uh, contains all the impurities that are in the solution. So if you're trying to purify and get very good uh, uranium product, this is not the way to do it. You want smaller crystals that, can, that are entirely solid uh, material well-formed that can be washed readily. And in this case, with this low uh, growth, uh, they, the growth occurred on the vessel walls, for example. So this illustrates a uh, different set of conditions that gave you much smaller, uh, purer crystals that were easier to wash. There's a dime, just to give you an idea of the size, um, as compared to these rather large crystals. Uh, the smaller crystals, as I mentioned, can be more effectively washed. There's a series of kind of rules of thumb. One, one group is called Weimarn's Laws of Precipitation. Uh, they're not really uh, thermodynamic laws, but they're uh, kind of rules of thumb. So a higher initial supersaturation tends to give smaller average crystal size. That can be good in some cases. Uh, in other cases, as uh, Ray mentioned with uh, iron hydroxide, you can get very, very small crystals which uh, agglomerate into a mud-like material that's very difficult to wash and, and uh, collect. Uh, nucleation and growth uh, on the vessel walls tends to encourage aggregation into clusters uh, and, and larger aggregates of crystals. Uh, 
So you tend to want to agitate your solutions to give smaller and more uniform crystals. So that's a lot of what the uh, technology of uh, crystallization and precipitation is about, is controlling the size of the solids you get. Uh, so just want to show a few examples of that and, and also talk about batch and continuous processes. So for uh, actinide operations where uh, criticality is possible, for example, with plutonium or enriched uranium, uh, batch operations have an advantage in that they, you can allow clean out and inspection between batches to avoid uh, building up a critical mass. So you can look at your apparatus after each uh, run and be sure that uh, you haven't got any material accumulated somewhere where it could get you into trouble later. Also makes materials accountability easier. So we tend to do batch operations in, uh, for example, the plutonium facility. But there are many types of equipment for batch and continuous uh, precipitation crystallization operations. And so I just thought I'd give a few examples. Uh, in the case of uh, plutonium oxalate, I showed you a picture of plutonium-3 oxalate. The French use uh, plutonium-4 oxalate precipitation. They rapidly mix the solutions. Uh, they, they feed that mixture after allowing it a little time to form the crystals onto a rotating vacuum filter wheel. So the solution comes out, uh, the solid is uh, collected on the uh, stainless steel filter wheel. It move, it's moving. It moves over to an area where the solid gets washed. It, it moves over. It's uh, more suction is applied. It's partially dried. And then there's a, a blade to scrape off the product into a boat. And the boat goes for calcining. Uh, and, and this is done uh, continuously for a relatively large batch of uh, solution. And that uh, plutonium would, say, go into MOX fuel, for example. Uh, JAEA, that's the Japan Atomic Energy Agency, is investigating the recovery of urine nitrate from used commercial uh, fuel after it's dissolved in nitric acid. Rather than removing all the uranium in the uh, solvent extraction processes, as uh, Bob described for, for Purex, they want to remove a significant amount of the uranium up front by uh, externally cooling the uh, solution and getting uranyl nitrate hexahydrate to form in the solution and collect it that way. What's the advantage of that? If they collect 70 to 90 percent of the uranium, which is the target in that first crystallization step, they can uh, downsize all the equipment, solvent extraction equipment after that, remembering that the uranium is the bulk of the used fuel, often uh, constituting 95 percent. Uh, that can give them an advantage in lowering the capital costs uh, in, the, in the rest of the plant. Uh, we looked for a while at an adiabatic evaporative loop crystallizer for uranyl nitrate recovery, and I'll just briefly mention that as another example of a way you can do the uh, continuous crystallizing. So here's the Japanese apparatus. Uh, they have a screw type apparatus. They introduce the solution, the heated solution, down lower in the, in the apparatus here as this nice yellow uranyl nitrate hexahydrate comes out of solution as they cool it. Uh, it's collected on the screw type apparatus comes up to the top, so the, the screw is effectively scraping uh, any crystals that uh, form on the walls. Falls out in the top, uh, goes to a centrifugal basket filter to remove most of the uh, liquid, and then you can also wash it there. Uh, in their process, if they want to adjust using uh, oxidizing agents to take the plutonium up to six, plutonium six and uranium six can be recovered together. Uh, this shows a picture from one of their test runs of the uh, crystals, and they have a fairly nicely controlled average crystal size around 730 uh, microns, and they, that's been uh, reported in the literature. So that's one way to do a, a continuous crystallizer. Is that just a water wash to bring the nitric acid residue? It's usually dilute acid just so you don't precipitate anything else, uh, you're going to have fission products in there. So if you used water, you might precipitate okay. plutonium if you're not trying to get the plutonium out. 
or other fission products. So it'll be a, a cold uh, dilute acid. Uh, this is a loop type crystallizer that uh, we were doing experiments with. So you'll notice the same yellow color of the uranyl nitrate hexahydrate crystals. In this case, rather than a, uh, a screw type um, cylindrical vessel, we have a loop crystallizer. What this allows you to do is have more control over the uh, growth of the crystals. The feed is here at the bottom. You have relatively hot solution coming in. Uh, the, the crystallizer in this case ran at a lower temperature, so as soon as that liquid comes in, it's super saturated, begins to form crystals. But there are already crystals in here, and so they tend to, to add to the growth of those crystals. It circulates around. In this case, we were providing uh, both concentration and cooling by having this at reduced pressure and removing some water and nitric acid from the top as a, a distillation operation. That also, the boiling drove the loop, so you didn't need any mechanical pumps in that part. And the, as the crystals came down the other side of the loop to come back to the origin, you have an area to remove the crystals to go to a filter to collect them. In this case, you would alternate between uh, a filter uh, media that would collect for a while, and then, on, then you would switch to another one, begin collecting, and wash the, the, the crystals on the other, uh, the original filter. You also have a device in here to remove the fines. Very small crystals would be removed. That solution would be heated to redissolve them, and that would be fed back into the feed. That's a way to keep the crystal size in a particular range, a way to remove the fines, redissolve them. And uh, these types of crystallizers can give you very precise control of your crystal size and, and your growth of mechanism. And uh, that's one of their advantages. But it's a more complicated operation, certainly. Can I have a question? How sure. tall is that? That was about four. I should stay close. And the question was, uh, how tall was that? Uh, it's about four feet tall, the, uh, the loop part of the crystallizer. The tanks were um, uh, eight feet on the side. And they were critically safe if you were going. These, of course, were not done with uh, um, plutonium in that, in that case. But if you were going to do that in the plant, you'd want to keep those tanks critically safe. So uh, now turning to uh, a little more about precipitation, again, where you add a reagent to generate the supersaturation. These are some of the general properties of the different oxidation states uh, with various uh, uh, ligands that you can add, so hydroxide, fluoride, et cetera, and gives you an idea of what things are soluble and insoluble. And so uh, as Bob was noting this morning, the um, uh, uh, fluorides were used to carry uh, some of the uh, actinides to recover uh, in the original uh, co-precipitations, but the, the hexavalent and at least the pentavalent K, uh, systems, it says insoluble here, but some of them are soluble enough that the, the five and six can be retained in solution while the three and four would be uh, uh, carried with, a, with a, uh, another precipitating fluoride. And so you can use these uh, different solubilities to do uh, separations. Uh, again, I mentioned very briefly co-precipitation or carrier precipitation. So if you have a, a trace of an actinide metal that's uh, too low to precipitate, even if you add a very large amount of a precipitating agent. In many cases, it'll co-precipitate if the anion is something that that bulk actinide would, would not be very soluble if, if it were up at a higher concentration. So again, with the, with the trivalent and, and tetravalent fluorides, you tend to uh, get those precipitating with uh, fluorides, for example, of the lanthanides. So these co-precipitation methods are very common features of radioanalytical procedures where you have small amounts of, of the elements in solution. There's a monograph series that describes uh, many of those techniques and that those are great sources of information for uh, doing analytical separations. And the tiny quantities of plutonium in the first preparations from in the Manhattan Project days
were too small to precipitate directly, and they used these co-precipitations to uh, both deduce the chemical properties of plutonium before they even had a measurable or a weighable amount, and some of the other new actinides. And these techniques were developed in the early 1900s 100s for the study of uh, radioisotopes when radium and other uh, radioactive species were being studied. So uh, very briefly, I want to talk about the, uh, some of those techniques. Bob mentioned those this morning. Uh, why describe these at all? I, I would say one, one good reason is that um, this may be something that someone who is trying to hide a nuclear program might, might use, for example. So you need to be aware of them, or at least those who worry about uh, proliferation of nuclear weapons need to be aware of, because you might use something that isn't an efficient industrial process. You might not want to use Purex. One, it's uh, uh, got uh, quite a bit of equipment to set up. But you, if you're trying to hide something, you may want to use something that people don't expect. So we, we certainly know that um, Iraq, for example, in their program, they were looking at calutrons to uh, enrich uranium, which was not the, uh, the gas centrifuges are the modern uh, way of doing that. They were also looking at those as well. But they, they looked at some more, some older techniques because they may be simpler and uh, easier to hide. So in this case, and I'm not going to go into detail, uh, Bob described this briefly already, but the precipitation of lanthanum fluoride will carry the actinide 3 and 4 oxidation states with it, both plutonium and neptunium, for example, but not the actinide 5 and 6. And then you could use various reagents to oxidize the neptunium and plutonium back and forth, uh, uh, well, oxidize the, to the higher oxidation states and use reducing agents to get it to, to lower oxidation states. And if you had the right oxidizing agent, you could oxidize the neptunium but not the plutonium and separate those as well. So the, the first lanthanum fluoride batch uh, in, this, in this process to separate the first weighable amount from this 90 kilograms of of irradiated uranium was about 40 grams of lanthanum fluoride. By the end, you, were, you had a 120 microliter solution containing about 40 micrograms of plutonium, and these solutions were manipulated in specially designed uh, glass vessels viewed through a microscope. So this was uh, quite a heroic effort. Uh, now, as we've noted, and this is an old number, I would round this off to about 3,000 metric tons of plutonium exist in the world. Most of that is in used fuel. It's in storage. But hundreds of tons have been separated, both for weapons programs and for the, in the commercial fuel cycle. Um, the bismuth phosphate process is another co-precipitation process that was used, and it had advantage, advantages over the uh, lanthanum fluoride co-precipitation. Again, I won't go through the details here. Bob mentioned most of those. But as he pointed out, the scale up he had 10 to the 9. I had 10 to the 8, but 10 to the 9 is probably good. It's a remarkable story. Very good decontamination uh, was um, obtained in, in the process, and it was later replaced by the solvent extraction processes for the reasons he discussed. And, uh, and for one, re one reason, good reason is you recover both the uranium and the plutonium. Oops, did I go too far? Yes, can we go back? One, can I? There we go. And again, I don't want to get into the details uh, other than, you know, if you're going to be looking for someone doing this uh, process uh, in a clandestine operation, you kind of want to be aware of the reagents, et cetera, you might use. This just shows the overall flow. And at the end, they did some uh, concentration using the lanthanum fluoride as well. So it was really, even though it was bismuth phosphate as the primary um, co-precipitation process at the end, they used the lanthanum fluoride also to uh, help give them a more concentrated product at the end. Okay, so uh, precipitation processes uh, are used commonly in uh, uranium and plutonium processing. Uh, our major products for plutonium processing are the metal for fuels and weapons components and oxides for fuels and heat sources, for example, for the plutonium-238 heat sources in uh, deep space missions. Uh, most 
aqueous plutonium processing takes place in nitric acid or hydrochloric acids. The most common precipitation agents are uh, oxalate, peroxide, fluoride, and hydroxide. And what you're looking for in these processes are, of course, a high yield and, and the form suitable for your, your next step. You want to remove common impurities. Uh, for example, some iron is always present in our stainless steel equipment or in some of the processing, as Bob described, aluminum's added. Uh, and in, in uh, some of our processing, aluminum's added to complex fluoride uh, in some cases. Uh, it and it should provide a convenient method to concentrate these from relatively dilute solutions. So just to illustrate a few of those, here's the plutonium-3 oxalate precipitation again. This is the uh, material you get, this, this hydrated um, oxalate precipitation, a uh, nice color, uh, useful for concentrations of plutonium greater than approximately one gram per liter uh, and less than four molar acid concentration. If you go higher than that, it, it just won't precipitate. Uh, much, much higher than that, it won't precipitate because the acid will compete with the plutonium for the um, oxalate. You can get good decontamination in this from a variety of metal ions. Uh, if you have americium-3 and lanthanum-3, they'll co-precipitate. They're very similar ions, so you, you need to be aware of that. Uh, it's a nice filterable solid. Uh, you can see this This is just a common uh, Buchner uh, funnel boat. Uh, it was easy to uh, uh, separate this trivalent uh, plutonium uh, oxalate. That's one of the reasons we like it in the uh, plutonium facility, and it's readily calcined to your product, which is PuO2. Uh, if you want to remove plutonium-3 and 4 from uh, very dilute solutions, uh, co-precipitation with calcium-2 and pluto or lead-2 oxalates is, a, is an interesting, is a useful analytical procedure. Plutonium-4 can also be precipitated as the oxalate. Uh, that has been the uh, route that the French have used in their MOX process that shows some uh, plutonium-4 oxalate, a more brown or brown-green material. Uh, the colors are not quite accurate when you take pictures through the glove box window, which tends to have a little uh, yellowness in it. Um, it tends to form a, a finer solid that can be more difficult to uh, filter, but if you do it carefully, you can get a nicely filterable material. You get good decontamination from some of the common metal ions. And uh, more recently, uh, in the current French process, they mix uh, the uranium oxide and the plutonium oxide together, grind them up, and then uh, make fuel pellets out of that. But a better uh, process, if you could do it easily and cheaply, would be to have the uh, plutonium and uranium atomically mixed in the, in the oxide. And one way you can do that is by co-precipitating them, and they're working on that in France co-precipitating uranium-4 and plutonium-3 at the same time uh, as the oxalates and um, calcining that material and getting something where the uh, plutonium and uranium are in the same uh, oxide crystal and atomically dispersed, which gives you better behavior in the fuel that you make. Plutonium-4 peroxide is a good way of uh, precipitating um, plutonium and, and purifying it substantially from a variety of other uh, materials. It gives you a non-stoichiometric solid that approaches what you'd expect for plutonium with two peroxides on it, but it doesn't quite get there in most of the situations. It incorporates small amounts of other anions that are present in the solution. So, for example, if you precipitate it from nitric acid solution, you'll have some nitrate in there. Uh, if done properly, it gives you a very filterable hexagonal form at somewhat higher acidities. If you go too low, you get a very difficult to filter gelatinous form, uh, much like some of the iron hydroxides that uh, Ray mentioned. Get good decontamination from many other elements except other actinide tetravalents. The structure, uh, we suspect, is something like this in this non-stoichiometric solid. This is a very stoichiometric solid we get by 
uh, crystallizing plutonium-4 out of alkaline solution with peroxide. And this is the structure where you have these two bridging peroxides between two of the plutonium-4 ions. And in the case of these high pH solutions where we had carbonate, you get six carbonate anions uh, coordinating. And overall, this is an uh, eight minus cation that forms. Gives you these very nice crystals. Uh, this shows one of the uh, problems with uh, radioactive materials. After a week or so, these crystals are considerably damaged by the alpha radiation. So you need to work quickly in some cases. Sure. The, in terms of non-stoichiometric, um, I mean, I guess, can you explain that a little bit? Is that in terms of the lattice that, that gets developed? How does that, I've always just seen stoichiometric kind of problems. I mean, everyone always talks about that. And I'm, I don't think I really understand what that means. All right, the question was, uh, what does it mean when the uh, crystal is, is non-stoichiometric? Uh, I don't mean to imply that it's not charge balanced. So it is charge balanced. But you get different anions balancing the charge of the cation in that case. And it's variable. So depending on the concentration of other anions in the solution, in other words, you could totally balance the charge of the plutonium with two peroxide two minus anions. In acid solution, under the conditions at least where people have commonly done the work, you never get that. You get a certain amount of chloride or nitrate or sulfate, whatever else is in the solution, coming along with it. So you're, you're perfectly balancing the charge. There's four minus for every four plus, but you get a mixture. And uh, I think it's partly explained by that structure it's pretty easy to replace those ligands on the outer part. You've got the plutonium and the peroxides as the core. And then you have these other coordination sites, and so you can have water and other anions out there. In an acid solution, that tends to happen. Uh, but um, to tell you when it's going to happen and when it isn't, that's, that's a little hard to predict. Uh, in alkaline solution, uh, we, we don't tend to see that. But on the acid side, it's a more delicate balance. I hope that yeah. covers the answer. Is that peroxide uh, approach used commercially by uh, The question was, is the peroxide approach used commercially by anyone? Uh, I think in some of, uh, commercially would be, uh, have to be in, in Europe or Japan. Um, I don't know that the uh, Kojima uses it anywhere commercially at the moment. I, uh, CEA. Um, uh, the weapons laboratories use it, but that's not really commercial. Um, uh, but for uranium, as I'll mention, the uranium peroxide is used commercially, the precipitation. And I'll just, I'll get to that pretty quickly. In fact, uh, this, is, this is exactly it. <laughs> uh, uranium-6 uh, can also be precipitated uh, with peroxide. And... Um, that is, again, gives you pretty good decontamination from a variety of other elements. Uh, it's done, in, the, in this case, not at uh, higher acid, but at a pH of around 2.5 to 4. And it gives uh, a species that's usually written UO4.xH2O. What that really means is you have uranium-6, this uranial, with one peroxo uh, associated with it some waters, and some of those can be inner sphere waters, that's what this means, bound to the metal ion. And then others are lattice waters that bind the, the crystal together that are hydrogen bonding on the outside. Uh, it's a nice precipitate. Um, again, this is done commercially for some of the mining and milling operations where they're covering uranium. But it's not universal, certainly. They use other ways, and I'll, I'll mention a few of those. But uh, this is a good way to also purify the uranium. Readily calcined then to your next product, which is usually U308. So this is, uh, again, one form of yellow cake, if you will. But if you calcine it after this uh, to U308, it'll be black. Uh, you can also precipitate the uranium-6 uh, with base, either a hydroxide or ammonia, for example. Uh, magnesia is sometimes used. And you get various polyurinates, and that's another form of yellow cake. 
Uh, simple formulas are often written for these uh, precipitates, such as this for ammonium diurinate, as it's called. But the solid phases are often much more complicated than that. They're not a simple, uh, single uh, crystal structure. Uh, preliminary uh, pH adjustment in these solutions can be done to 3.5 to 4.2 to remove uh, iron-3. So iron being a very high charge to radius ratio a metal ion uh, precipitates at relatively low pH as the hydroxide. This may not be easy to remove, but it's a relatively small amount uh, and uh, can be removed from the uranium so it won't precipitate. Uh, then you go to higher pH to precipitate the uranium, then that's calcined to U308 or U03. Uh, but remembering that hydroxides of impurities, such as iron, will be incorporated unless you do something to remove them uh, beforehand. So, whoops, did I hit something? I hope not. Uh, very briefly, just wanted to finish up with a few other precipitations that were used uh, at Hanford to recover cesium and strontium. Uh, you know, tens of millions of curies, it's a lot of activity, was recovered uh, by, uh, for a, and it was going to be used for irradiation sources and thermoelectric generators, and also to reduce the heat load in the, in the waste tanks. I mean, the, the waste tanks in some cases were boiling initially when the, just from the internal heat, and that's primarily from the cesium and strontium decay. And, and also to explore methods for advanced uh, fuel cycle separations. So of those tens of millions of curies, the first 30,000 or so of cesium was recovered using a nickel ferrocyanide precipitation. Uh, so the acid raffinate, this is from the Purex operation now. So uh, after the plutonium and uranium have been removed, the rest of the fission products and the minor actinides are still in that acid raffinate. It was concentrated, partially denitrated, and then this feed was neutralized with sodium hydroxide and ammonia, and that precipitated a lot of the fission and corrosion products, so that was a hydroxide precipitation. Then you filtered that supernatant, that, which contained the, the cesium, acidified it to four, boiled it to remove CO2, which was carbonate, which would interfere uh, with, with the uh, separation. Then add nickel-2 and fer ferrocyanide, and you precipitate this nickel-2 uh, ferrocyanide material that exchanges some of the nickel for cesium, and so brings out a lot of the cesium. Then that was later processed to free the cesium up and give you the cesium in the form you wanted. It was later replaced by another uh, precipitation of the cesium directly from the acid feed, so you didn't have to do this neutralization. You found a more selective uh, precipitation using phosphotungstic acid. Uh, this is a, a type of uh, ferrocyanide. It's not the same one. It's not the nickel that they were using. This is one that we were looking at in our labs, also very selective for binding cesium. But this is one of the nasty precipitates that Ray was referring to yesterday. This material is very finely divided, uh, gelatinous, solid, and this is what uh, generally these uh, ferrocyanides give you. And so it's one, another reason for moving away from those processes. These were not easy materials to collect and, and deal with. That's very much like it's a very dark blue <coughs> mud. Uh, but the structure, uh, even though the crystallites are very small in this case, uh, you, you see the, the irons connected by the, the cyanide ligands form this uh, cubic lattice, and to balance the charge, the cesium ions fit in those, those gaps. Cesium is the right size to give you very good uh, binding in there, whereas other elements, other alkali metal cations like rubidium, potassium, Sodium bind, being smaller bind less well in that uh, in that cavity, and then again uh, another uh, first million curies of strontium ninety was recovered at Hanford using a lead sulfate coprecipitation process. Again, I won't go through the details of that. In this case, though, the uh, precipitate was. Uh, tough to collect, so they used centrifugation to do that, something, again, very finely divided. And then you could uh, 
after that lead sulfate collected the um, strontium, uh, you could uh, you converted that sulfate to a carbonate, and that carbonate could be dissolved in nitric acid. When you hit that with nitric acid, the carbonate goes off as CO2, and uh, you could then use another precipitation uh, to get the um, lanthanides out that came along with with the strontium, and uh, get a relatively pure strontium for uh, further operations. Later, this was replaced by a, a solvent extraction process as well. So uh, these are just examples. Uh, again, precipitation, co-precipitation, and crystallization are important part of the toolbox, if you will, for um, s separations. Uh, they have a great variety of applications in industrial operations, and uh, they'll continue to be used, uh, certainly for the foreseeable future, and certainly have some applications, uh, we feel, in the, uh, some of the advanced fuel cycles under development. So happy to take any, any questions. Let's see. Uh, the question was at the Hanford tanks, how many did they do that with? Um, I, I don't know the exact answer. A large, it was certainly not all of the uh, raffinate, but a significant number of tanks were processed, were campaigned to uh, recover a few million curies. Uh, I'm guessing it was on the order of 10%, but you know, those are numbers we could look up if, you, if you're interested and, and, and find those. It's, it's, yeah, it's actually a, a third of all the radioactivity at the Hanford site is in those season that's trying to Yeah. Ah, okay. It's, it's a problem that some of these found that we had. For those who couldn't hear, um, I, a more knowledgeable colleague, uh, Steve Cron, informed us that it was 30% of the or about a third, 33% of the uh, cesium and strontium was removed from some of the tanks, so larger than I thought. But that's a lot of activity was processed then to uh, remove the cesium and strontium. Not all of it by precipitation processes, but some of it. Yeah, there was a much larger campaign that they used ion exchange. Uh, it was a CS100, I believe, ion exchange process that they used. Uh, a, a significant portion of the uh, strontium and cesium capsules came from a little bit later program than the one that was described here. So, yeah, there were later campaigns that recovered even more, as we've, we've uh, heard.